Right, so welcome everybody. Um, in this video, I wanted to do a quick overview on uh, how you can make uh, an extension for uh, JupyterLab and also for the new major version of the Jupyter Notebook interface. So uh, we're going to go through a lot of the steps uh, you need to do to be able to create your extension. Uh, maybe the first thing we can do is have a look at uh, the interfaces we're going to be working with. So let me switch that here. So in Jupyter Lab, um, if you open it, this is pretty much what you get. So here we are using a uh, a binder instance, uh, so it's a bit easier to test it. But uh, when you open it, you get uh, something like this. So uh, a bunch of uh, panels on the left side, uh, you also have some panels on the right side and a launcher where you can uh, click on a, a card to open and create a notebook and then you can stop typing some code here. So you probably, if you are here, you're probably familiar with this because you know, pretty much want to make an extension for this kind of interface here. Um, maybe one thing I need to mention is uh, on this binder, uh, we're using uh, the latest uh, 4.0 pre-release. Uh, I will explain a bit later why. So this is going to be the next uh, major version for JupyterLab. So 4.0, uh, hopefully expected in the common, coming weeks or month, um, probably early 2023. Um, but yeah, still, still on a, a work in progress right now. So yeah, so if you open this interface, uh, you get a bunch of things and in JupyterLab, uh, one of the key ideas is that everything is an extension. So, you know, you have the notebook here, that's pretty much an extension. Uh, all of the left panels here, are menu items can also be added as an extension. So, yeah, that makes a, like, a very modular and very uh, customizable uh, environment. And uh, this is why there is also an extension system is that anyone could pretty much write an extension for it. So yeah, so we're going to look at how we can make an extension for uh, JupyterLab and focusing on the front-end extensions, which means adding some uh, UI element to the interface here. But before uh, we start, I wanted to give you also a uh, quick uh, overview of the notebook interface. So uh, for a very long time, actually for many, many years, uh, the Jupyter notebook interface uh, looked like this. So uh, you get your files uh, here in the file browser and you can create a notebook uh, this way. And this starts what we call the classic notebook interface. So you know, like the good old notebook that's been around for, for many years. Uh, you know, just the same as you can uh, enter some code, uh, do some things here. But you notice that compared to JupyterLab, there is not much more than just a notebook, right? You don't have a status bar or left or right areas. At least they are not hidden, uh, not um, visible by default. Uh, but you can still work with uh, uh, Python code and your notebook with this. So this thing has been around for a very long time. But uh, the past couple of years, uh, it's pretty much been in maintenance mode. So nothing really changed. Uh, in terms of features, code base changes, or even security fixes. Uh, so it's been really a kind of a dormant uh, project for a very long time. So I think the trend, the trend was to try to tell people to move to a JupyterLab uh, interface instead. Um, but what we noticed um, actually is that uh, a lot of people really like the, uh, you know, the single document oriented interface for a notebook environment. So originally the plan was to kind of let this classic notebook interface like it is and maybe uh, deprecate it at some point or even just archive it. But um, since a lot of people still like this, uh, there has been some uh, discussion since then and one of the um, outcomes of it was to 
actually instead of kind of terminating the project or not touching anymore, the idea would be to rebuild it, um, but using uh, JupyterLab components. So this is something that has been uh, proposed as a, as a JEP. So it's called the Jupyter Enhancement Proposal. And then the, all of the details are here. So you can have a look if you would like to. It gives you more context on why we have this notebook V7 uh, coming soon. And if you open a notebook V7 interface, so it's been already so a couple of pre-releases out there, uh, you get something like this. So that's something that looks uh, very close to the classic notebook, and that's actually the, the goal uh, of this new version. So you can just work the same way as you would in a classic notebook here, but uh, instead you get this uh, new interface built on uh, modern components. So you will see a lot of things look a lot like a uh, classic notebook and also like uh, Jupyter Lab. So for example, you get uh, support for themes here. Uh, it's quite useful, but you get also support for uh, popular um, third-party extensions. There used to be third-party extensions before, but now they, since they are built into JupyterLab uh, directly, uh, you can reuse them very easily from here. So uh, let's see if I put a markdown set here, uh, title and execute, get my table of content on, on the left side. Uh, there is even support for the debugger. Uh, right here. So all of this is hidden by default, but it's still there just in case. And the most important thing is <clears throat> this is uh, maintain code. This is just JupyterLab code, uh, kind of reassembled in a way, uh, in a different way to produce this kind of interface. And the main takeaway is that if you can write an extension for JupyterLab, uh, it can also work uh, in this Jupyter notebook. Uh, seven interface and this is exactly what we're going to look at uh, right now. Okay, so refer to this if you want to know more and um, a bit more context also on the, where all of this is going uh, to happen. So in uh, the Jupyter Notebook 7 code base is now in the Jupyter Notebook uh, repo. So if you are curious and you want to know more about how it works and how it's you know built, uh, you can go there and there will be everything. <clears throat> All right, so it's still a pre-release, so it's not a final release. Um, you still need to use the dash dash pre um, flag when installing with pip. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for the kind of intro. Um, so one thing people really ask often is, how do I get started to writing JupyterLab extensions? So if you go to the JupyterLab docs, so maybe we can go back to this uh, landing page first. So it's jupyterlab.readthedocs.io, but you can also find a link from the JupyterLab repo. Uh, you end up here, and you know a lot of the documentation is about uh, the UI using the UI, but uh, some parts of the documentation is, are also about writing extensions. So um, maybe let me switch to the latest version instead. Yes. So the latest version of the docs is targeting the JupyterLab 4.0 uh, at the moment. And the other one is targeting uh, the latest stable release, which is uh, 3.5.2 uh, right now. So instead, we're going to look at this. So you see that it's kind of changed because the theme changed in the meantime. But the most important is to go here to develop extension. And you get this landing page uh, right here. So uh, you see that uh, there are a bunch of things here. So where to look for uh, information, so common extensions point, explains you like all of the different elements you can find in, in JupyterLab. So if, you know, if we go back here, menu, commons, we have a common palette as well. So all of this is uh, detailed here. And uh, you get also links to other resources. Uh, one of the most important one when you start writing a JupyterLab extension is the, the extension tutorial. So we're going to open it here. And uh, you get kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, walkthrough. 
uh, making your extension, packaging it, and explaining like you know what you pretty much are doing. And, uh, we're going to do something like this uh, right now. So uh, we're not going to follow exactly the tutorial because uh, you could always do it uh, on your own. So we're going to do something very similar. So it's pretty much going to be the same steps, but the content of the extension will be slightly different. So at least it gives uh, one more example um, to refer to if needed. All right. So yeah, one of the most uh, interesting resources is this one when you get started uh, writing extensions. And also the uh, extensions examples uh, repository. So we get uh, a few examples there uh, that you can uh, refer to. So they are really uh, small and also focused on specific things. So if you want to learn more about how to manage settings or signals or how to add comments, you can just, uh, you know, go there and each extension is its own package. So it's really well isolated. And you even have some um, a little guides here in the readme that kind of uh, gives you this cut snippets as well. So you know, you know, where to focus at a given time. Right, so that's it. Um, so we can get started. Um, maybe first thing we could do is have a look at what kind of extension we want to make. So here the idea would be to make a JupyterLab extension uh, that works in JupyterLab, but that also works in a Jupyter notebook, just to show you that, you know, both, uh, that the same extension can work with both interfaces without any changes. So here, um, so on this repo here, we had, uh, there is an, an issue about um, uh, adding an example for showing a custom logo on, in the top right corner of the interface. So something like this. So. We don't have any example like this for right now. So I figured it could be a good way to do it right now, like um, uh, as a as a little exercise. And maybe, you know, if it works out well, we can just contribute back to the extension examples repo. So yeah, let's try to do this. Uh, first, we're going to make it work in JupyterLab, and then we're going to check if it works well in uh, the Jupyter Notebook 7. Interface. So if you follow the tutorial, all of this is explained, but here uh, we're going to go straight to the um, cookie cutter uh, repository. The cookie cutter repository is like you get everything you need to uh, make your extension and package it and use it from within JupyterLab. Okay, so if you go there, it's also again in the tutorial, so you can uh, copy this line here. So first we will need to create, uh, to install cookie cutter to be able to use it. So one thing I, I haven't mentioned yet is that we will need to uh, set up an environment. So for setting up uh, an environment, you have multiple things, multiple choices in Python. You can use the the built-in VN uh, module, uh, or you can use uh, Conda. Uh, in my case, I like to use uh, another tool called uh, MicroMamba, which is based on Mamba. And it's, uh, you can see, if you don't know uh, about Mamba or MicroMamba, it's pretty much just a drop-in replacement for Conda, except that it's, um, uh, much faster and it's also I find it much uh, simpler to use as well like Macromamba is just a single binary you can put it anywhere on your machine and you just you know make a link to it and you can use the binary to create your environments um, so I find it pretty neat and pretty useful so this is what what I like to use of course you can use something else but uh, if you don't know about it I really uh, encourage you to check it out so Let's uh, let's get started. So we're going to spawn a terminal. So you can put your uh, your files uh, where wherever you want. Um, so first, we're going to create a an environment. So Mamba 
create uh, n, and we're going to call it JupyterLab uh, top area text. And we're going to pass it some dependencies directly. So uh, we use the Conda Forge channel. And we install the cookie color like we saw earlier. We also install uh, not JupyterLab, not right now. Uh, we're going to install Python. And, um, and that's it. So press Y to automatically uh, approve the creation of the environment. Downloads a couple of things like the list of packages, and uh, it should get started soon. Yep. All right. So now, if I do um, Mamba activate, so in my case, Mamba is also an alias for Macro Mamba, so it's a bit easier to type. Um, Jupyter Lab, the Opera, and then you even get the auto completion with Macro Mamba, which is uh, quite neat. So you see that we have the environment activated uh, right here. And uh, we now need to install Python, um, we install uh, Jupyter Lab and Notebook, and we use uh, the pre release. So we're going to pull Jupyter Lab 4 and Notebook uh, 7. Uh, we're using pick because uh, Notebook 7 is not on Conda Forge yet. And uh, Jupyter Lab 4 is, but then, yeah, we will still need to install Notebook. So the suite with pip, in that case, it's a bit, a bit easier. Okay. I can do a quick pip list, and I think we should be able to find out our dependencies. Yep, we pulled uh, 31, alpha 31 here, and uh, the latest alpha for the notebook uh, as well. Okay, so we have our um, environment, and what we can do now is uh, create the repo. So let's do this. I'm going to paste this, but since we're going to target the pre-releases, uh, we're going to do a checkout of the folder uh, O branch, which has you know, all of the packages updated for Jupyter uh, Lab 4 and the Notebook 7. Uh, yeah. Uh, like we said in the beginning, mm, just to keep it simple, we're just going to make a normal front end extension right here. So uh, here you can specify your name. I'm just going to leave it like it is. Uh, this as well. Uh, lab extension name, we could say Jupyter Lab uh, top area uh, text. And Python, uh, we're going to keep like this with uh, underscores instead of hyphens. Um, we can give it a description, so a Jupyter Lab extension to add text in the top area. In our case, the extension won't have any settings, so just need to know. Um, here, has binder, uh, what it means is that whether or not you get the config to be able to test your extension on binders. So usually it's good practice to have it. So we're going to say yes. And uh, test, well, ideally you should, you know, um, always write test or test your extension. But I think here for the sake of com uh, simplicity, uh, we're just going to skip it. Uh, there won't be any, there won't be uh, uh, too many files generated uh, this way. Otherwise, what it, get, it gives you is, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, packages you need for running unit tests with chest, and I think also the ones for running uh, visual regression tests uh, using Playwright and, uh, and Galata. But 
you can check uh, on the cookie cutter if you if you want to know more about this. Uh, I really recommend it, but just here to keep it simple, uh, we're going to skip it. And uh, here, well, it's the same. Uh, I will let you, uh, you know, use the real link to your uh, GitHub repository. I'm just going to keep it like this, like it is right now. And um, and that's it. So we have our um, folder generated. Now we can just CD into it a top area. Okay, this one has underscore top array text. And list, this is what we get. So we get a bunch of files uh, by default. All right, so uh, maybe what we can do is um, open a text editor to look at what we have in this folder. So uh, a lot of people like to use uh, VS Code because it's uh, quite powerful and it's also uh, pretty popular. Uh, but you could you could use pretty much anything uh, anything else like if you prefer some other editor there's it's no it's no problem so uh, let's uh, zoom in a little bit okay so that's our files uh, that's a lot of files uh, but many of them are just you know placeholder files or configuration files so you get some. Yes, Lint and Prettier config uh, on by default. It's usually a good practice to have those uh, in your extension, just to make sure your code, you know, to, is well linted, and uh, it also helps catch some issues uh, uh, sometimes. So, a package JSON uh, file is pretty much where you're kind of define what your extension does, uh, the um, dependencies it needs. And also, uh, in the case of a JupyterLab extension, uh, where the uh, lab extension is being built. So this is in this metadata right here. Um, yeah, maybe we um, Yeah, let's check out the, the source code of the extension. So the extension by default is generated using um, this little code snippet. So that's very minimal. And you see that it, what it does is a console log uh, right here. So it's, yeah, now it's a bit better. It's a console log. And that means that if you uh, build your extension and you load uh, JupyterLab, this is what you should be able to get in your DevTools console. So uh, let's do that first. Uh, let's do that. Um, you also notice that here we have some red uh, underlying under the package. That means the, um, the editor here in that case, VS Code, was not able to find this package. And that's normal because we haven't uh, installed the dependencies yet. So we're going back to the terminal and we use a common called JLPM, which stands for uh, Jupyter Lab Manager, Package Manager. And it's just. Ah, OK. Cool. Um... <laughs> Well, so just to finish with JLPM, um, it's pretty much just an alias uh, to a, another package manager called Yarn, uh, which is used a lot within the you know, JavaScript and front-end development work. And uh, JLPM is more of a convenience kind of shortcut or alias uh, for using Yarn. Yeah, so here you see I've tried to use it. Um, but uh, it tells me that I don't have Node.js installed, uh, which means, yeah, I've actually forgot to uh, to add it to the dependencies uh, when creating the Conda environment. So fortunately, Node.js is uh, available on Conda, so I can install it like this. Um, on by install Conda Forge Node.js, and we're going to use uh, I think version eighteen. Um, one of the latest uh, stable releases and we say yes so now i can do node v and i have version 18.12.1 and i can run jlpm again and this time it's going to uh, start yarn under the hood and yarn is going to look at the packages you need so if we go back here we need 
these packages here as dependencies, but also all of these as dev dependencies to be able to develop the extension. The, by default, the extensions for Drupalab are built using TypeScript. So this is not JavaScript, this is TypeScript. Uh, you can see, pretty much see it as JavaScript with types. And this is also very useful because you get a lot of help from all of the static typing and uh, also nice completions if you use an editor like this one. Okay, so we see that uh, we have uh, installed the dependencies and now the editor doesn't show a red underlying under the, uh, the package, which means it's good, it's installed. And uh, now you have these node modules here where you get all of your dependencies for the extension. Okay, so the next thing uh, we can do now is try to uh, build so you can do, use the build script, jlpm run build. And it first compiles it using TypeScript, the TypeScript compiler to JavaScript. And then there is another step that uh, compiles it uh, with Webpack to produce a set of static assets. So these static assets would be uh, generated here uh, when building the extension and uh, then distributed when you distribute your Python package uh, to the others. So people using your extension won't have to do all of this, right? They don't, won't have to rebuild uh, the extension again. Uh, they can just use the static assets that are generated uh, right now. Okay, so one more thing. Um, so if you do, if we do JupyterLab extension list to list of our, all of our extensions, uh, we see, uh, so we can ignore the first one, uh, pigments comes by default. Um, this one comes from uh, the Jupyter Notebook 7. Uh, we see that it's activated and okay. Uh, we, we don't see the one we are currently uh, trying to, uh, to develop. So um, when you develop an extension, uh, you can use the Jupyter Lab extension develop command. Uh, you need to pass it a path to the extension to develop. And you can use the overwrite uh, flag to override the symlink. So what happens here is it's going to create symlinks between your uh, repo right here to um, your um, to the prefix where your JupyterLab uh, is installed. So here with Conda, uh, you get a virtual environment. So this is pretty much just linking your files to your uh, virtual environment at a very specific location where JupyterLab is able to find uh, the extensions. So this command, the develop here, uh, what it's actually doing right now, since we also forgot to do it before is it's actually doing python minus m pip install minus e dot, which means that you can develop this package in editable mode. And uh, now we should be able to see that this is a link to where this folder is. So, right, so if you do pwd, uh, this, this is pointing here. So that looks good. Um, you can rerun this lab extension list command. And uh, now uh, we see that it's right here. So that's great. Uh, we can do Jupyter lab. What I have to do is I don't want to start a browser automatically. So you can use the no browser uh, CLI flag. Uh, we copy this link here. We go back to our web browser and we can paste. We have uh, JupyterLab running right now. And we want to check. Yes, uh, we have our text. So you remember this is coming uh, from here. 
Cool. So we have the environment set up and uh, everything seems to be working. So maybe one thing we could do, uh, let me check. I'm going to close these tabs. We don't need them anymore. I need to make some space. Um, that we don't, that we can keep it around. Yeah, and go back here. Uh, since we have uh, the Jupyter Notebook 7 installed as well, uh, we can actually launch it from here. So Jupyter Notebook 7 adds a lab extension that you know, adds this little menu entry right here. So you can start it more easily like this. And um, we can see also here in the DevTools, Ah, okay, so we can, let's ignore this. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's an issue tracked uh, in the Tripyter Notebook 7, but it's not important right now. The important thing is this message is also uh, printed here. So that means the extension is also loaded in Tripyter Notebook 7, which is good because we didn't have to do anything uh, special. It's also uh, available right here. Maybe uh, we can create a notebook instead. That might be a bit easier. Yeah, so we have it here as well. Okay, so we can keep this page open and let's see how it was going to work. All right. So now, uh, if we go back to what we would like to do, we say we want to add a widget to the top area. So if you want to do something like this, um, like we said before, you can go and check if there is any examples, uh, kind of looks like what you would like to do. And then you look at the code there. So for example, uh, widgets here, widgets. And then you look at here the um, the readme. It tells you you know if you want to create a new widget, you use the readme widget package and you import the widget, and then you can add it to your application uh, right here with the shell .add. So we're going to do something uh, pretty much um, similar. Um, yeah, and otherwise you just can you know, always go back to the docs and learn more about all of these different extension points. So let's, uh, let's do this. So first we need to add the package. So Lumino, uh, Lumino widgets, and we're not going to use version one. Uh, we're going to use version two. Uh, alpha, which one is it right now? I don't know, I think it's six, right? So we used to, uh, it's the same, Lumino widgets uh, and then Lumino library, the one that provides all of this uh, kind of UI components for making Jupyter extensions is also currently a pre-release. And uh, it's going to be a uh, version two release soon, so. We can use this. I think it's alpha six. Uh, we will see anyway uh, if that works or not. And uh, here we can do um, the import. So Lumino widgets and widget. So here it doesn't complain. We read that uh, we don't have the package installed because um, it was probably installed via another dependency of this package. So if you get the node modules right here, uh, the Lumino, yeah, actually we have it here. So it's already installed. Um, but, uh, normally what you need to do now is, uh, actually we're going to stop this. And JLPM again, this is going to go through the packages you have. Uh, defining your package JSON and just making sure uh, they are correctly installed. So yeah, there we go. And um, we can keep this console log right now. It's quite useful in case you know when the extension is activated. 
and we create a new widget it goes new widget uh, and we add it to the shell so add the shell widget top all right so what about trying that first we rebuild so you can reuse the build command like this and you rebuild every time uh, there is also a watch command that you can activate once in the terminal and uh, it will pick up the new changes and rebuild the exception automatically for you so you don't have to run this every time so we can show you it show it to you uh, maybe next time just next time we need to build this all right so this is uh, built now we can start it again here yeah, and we we'll refresh all right so we still have our console log but now we get this message here which it's added to the app shell must have a unique ID property. So let's go and do this. Widget.id. Um, we can use a string like this, uh, or we can generate it uh, as well. So DOM utils. There is a DOM utils. Uh, helper uh, provided by one of the packages from Jupyterlab and uh, right now actually I don't even remember which one it is so we're going to do this dom utils from app utils yeah most likely it comes from app utils and again this is a new dependency so we can add it here app utils uh, normally you should rerun the glpm to install make sure you install the packages uh, correctly um, and uh, rebuild the extension but let's do one more change uh, before uh, we want to add some text in this widget so one way to do it is to create a new a node so we're going to create a div and then we can do node dot text content hello world for example and then we need to pass it uh, to the widget all right looks good to me so we can do uh, first i will show you the watch watch command so if you run watch uh, you see that it's going to uh, pick up the changes as you type so make some spaces here and just for the sake of demoing um, we can remove this for example press save go back here we see that there is a file change detected starting incremental compil compilation and rebuild your extension so that's quite useful uh, what you can do uh, like for example from your editor you could also do a, a new terminal and uh, run the command from here of course you will need to uh, first activate and, uh, activate the lab on top of react text you could do something like this yeah it starts it from here so you have at least one more terminal uh, available. Um, yeah, it's really up to you. And you know, people have different preferences when it comes to running scripts uh, automatically or not. So I'm going to leave it uh, right here because, yeah, let's leave it like this for now. And we can use this uh, main terminal to restart JupyterLab. And again here we refresh All right so we see that you know it's not the same message anymore right okay okay so uh there we go actually this is our little widget 
we have it here, it's visible. And if you go to notebook interface, add some space, let's ignore that. Oh, yeah, we, we have it here. So a little bit more, you know, at a random place. Um, that's fine uh, because uh, right now uh, we just uh, added it like this without specifying anything else uh, when adding the widget to the shell. So how do we put it uh, right of the top area? Okay, so here, if you go back uh, to the code where we add the widget, uh, you see that this add method accepts some options. So we can do open brackets. And here we have autocomplete, which suggests using the rank of 1000. So rank is going to be useful for uh, placing your widget in uh, in an area so actually the watch script is very very useful here we don't need to run it anymore the only thing we need to do is refresh the page um, right here and uh, we have it placed right out, uh, on the um, top right corner so that's that's good uh, we can also refresh uh, right here And we have it there. That's great. Um, I don't know, like, what could we do um, next? So it doesn't look that great. Like, it's a bit, uh, you know, misaligned. We could maybe try to fix this. And that would already be uh, good enough, I guess. All right, so to do this, we're going to use CSS. And don't be scared, CSS is, can be complicated sometimes, but um, in our case, uh, I hope not. So we're going to create a, a class, a, a new CSS class for uh, our element. So let's do top area of CSS class. I can use this kind of naming convention right here. And uh, before adding it to the shell, I mean, it could be also after, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're going to do add class and specify this uh, class right here. And in our space CSS file, we're going to do top area class, uh, not class, uh, text. And display flex and then we are going to justify content center and align item center and I guess that will be enough to center the text vertically so let's check uh, the extension should be with it right now no it's not um, that's fine uh, the other thing you can do when working on css is to use the inspector uh, right here and then select your element so we have it uh, right here uh, do we have is it actually no it's not hmm not sure actually the changes were picked up so let's just refresh one more time just to make sure hmm Okay, so one thing that could go wrong is the top area text is in the same name as this. Ah, okay. Here we have the dot, we shouldn't have it. 
wait for the extension to recompile. It's ready. And that's it. Yeah, now it works. Click here and you see we have our uh, CSS. Uh, also available with the dev tool. So yeah, one thing I wanted to show is, you know, if you want to go through this um, loop of going to your code, editing your code, waiting for extension to compile and then reload the page, uh, you could also make some very small adjustments right here. So one thing we could do uh, as an example, is add a small margin uh, to the right of 10px, right? And you see that now it's applied automatically, but this won't be saved automatically uh, in your code. So you have to go here and do a margin, right? And then we do 10px, save. Uh, wait, actually, for uh, this to complete, just to make sure. Okay, that's done. We refresh. Now we have a text with a little margin on the right side. You can even try without the DevTools open. That's cool. Um, let's try Notebook. Same, don't need DevTools. And there you go. And that's it. We have our extension. So that's, um, you can see, was mostly working on the plugin. And so that's TypeScript code. And we had to do a bit of styling work as well. And that was uh, with CSS. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it for like a very a uh, very small uh, extension, a very simple, a uh, very simple one. Maybe I can show you uh, where to go next. All right, so let's jump back to latest. Tutorial. So if you go back here, uh, I really encourage you to uh, to follow this as well. So you will learn a few more things. Um, you will also learn how to uh, use Git to be able to uh, version your code, make new changes, and then push it to uh, uh, platforms like GitHub, for example. And you also learn how to use different um, things like uh, components of the, of the um, GitHub interface, like the common palette. Uh, it's quite nice because it also shows you like the different lines you have to to use, you know, as you progress through the uh, the tutorials. So yeah, definitely a really good resource. And when it comes to packaging uh, your extension, uh, you can also learn more about it here. Um, maybe, maybe yeah, maybe if you're interested, uh, let me know. Uh, we could do another quick uh, video on showing how to package your thing, uh, your extension and distribute it on, on PyPI, for example, and also maybe on Conda Forge. All right, so I think that's it. Um, many thanks for uh, watching. So as you can see, it was kind of a raw format, uh, just going through uh, the steps for making an extension, trying to get it to work in JupyterLab and also in Jupyter Notebook 7. So if you already authored some uh, Jupyter Classic Notebook extensions before, uh, we hope this will at least give you some um, idea of where to look for, like if you're looking for resources or help, um, maybe making extensions that would target the new uh, major servant version of Jupyter Notebook. So yeah, don't hesitate to reach out uh, on GitHub and also on other mediums uh, you can find uh, online, like 
even opening GitHub issues or discussions on the repo if you have some questions or need help uh, migrating an extension or making a new one from scratch. Yeah, so enjoy and uh, have fun developing extensions. See you next time.